Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third part of our five, uh, five installment Workforce Wednesday briefing mini series set for the month of September. I'm Dan Bursette, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Today, our panel will discuss energy transitions in coal country. We've also already covered preparing high schoolers for green careers, and last week, a new spin on conservation course. For those of you who were with us last week, you might remember that one of our panelists, Chaz Robles, uh, Director of Conservation Legacy's Ancestral Lands Program, was hit with a power outage in the middle of his remarks. He has agreed to let us post a recording of his presentation on our briefing page, so be sure to check that out. His work in New Mexico is a great example of the latest successful and community-based evolution of a decades-old conservation core model. If you need to catch up, or if you would like to learn more about the wide range of climate, clean energy, and environmental topics we cover, take a moment to visit us online at www.eesi.org. The best way to stay up to date on briefings is of course to sign up for our bi-weekly Climate Change Solutions newsletter. Again this week, we have an impressive four-person lineup and we have a special guest. It is my privilege to introduce United States Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, who is joining us today via video recording and has prioritized finding a path toward a just transition to a decarbonized clean energy economy. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but I'm grateful for the chance to speak to you about this critical issue, even if it's from afar. As some of you may know, I am a member of the Democrat Special Committee on the Climate Crisis, where we're working to overcome a total rejection of climate science by Donald Trump and many members of his party. We believe we have to do this work, regardless of who is in the White House and who controls the Senate, because families, communities, and the planet cannot afford to wait. And key to addressing climate change is ensuring that every community feels whole as we transition to newer, cleaner energy sources. I hear often from coal families, for, ex for instance, whose parents and grandparents powered our nation's rise who worked in a hole in the ground to provide the energy that we needed and who have seen over a dozen coal, coal companies go bankrupt since 2017 alone. They often feel targeted by well-intentioned rhetoric aimed at addressing climate change, but they're struggling to see themselves in the future of some policymakers vision. We simply cannot allow that to be the case. A truly just environmental policy provides equality for all and lifts up communities in every corner every mile of our country, including in coal country. That's why I am proud to be leading the Marshall Plan for Coal Country Act. This bill would enhance funding for research and investment in clean coal technology, like carbon capture sequestration, and it would reestablish tax credits aimed at spurring new energy development. But more than that, it would provide support for small businesses, entrepreneurs, and families in coal country to establish thriving local communities my bill would help coal retirees safeguard their pensions when a mine closes down and would guarantee health care for workers affected by that closure. It would incentivize home ownership in these communities and it would provide government support in attracting new businesses into the community. That's why I think it is so important to, in, to introduce this Marshall Plan and I know together we can make it happen. Thank you for letting me be here today and it's such a pleasure and such an honor to be able to speak with you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us today, Senator Duckworth. Um, of course, we wish you could be with us in person as well. Um, but on behalf of everyone at EESI and in our audience today, thank you for your leadership on the issues we are about to discuss. I'm very happy to let Senator Duckworth's introduction stand on its own. I'm not sure there's anything I can add uh, to her words. Uh, but I do have a related update to announce, so I'll take a moment to do that. Just yesterday, we posted a bonus workforce briefing for next Friday, September 25th, titled Achieving an Equitable Future, the National Economic Transition Platform for Coal Communities. We are partnering with the Just Transition Fund to continue to explore issues facing coal communities and the solutions that are making a positive difference uh, against the backdrop of a rapidly evolving energy sector. This briefing will focus on the National Economic Transition Platform that the Just Transition Fund released over the summer. You can RSVP for this bonus briefing 
by visiting us online at www.eesi.org. And watch your inboxes for email reminders and updates, including links to register for the next two regular installments of Workforce Wednesdays, Growing Green Industry and Innovation, Mass Timber, and Low Carbon Small Business and Post-COVID Recovery. One last bit of logistics before we turn to our panel. After our final panelists, we will have time for questions from our online audience. If you have a question, please follow EESI on Twitter at EESI online and send in your questions that way. If you prefer, you can also send an email to, w to EESI at EESI.org. And now on to our panelists. First, we will hear from Mark Haggerty, who has been with Headwaters Economics for the past 10 years, working to understand why some communities do better than others and to communicate key lessons and policy ideas to people working to make their own states, counties, and towns more livable and sustainable. Mark's expertise is in fiscal policy, rural economic development, and community planning. Mark has served on local planning boards, worked with county commissioners and state legislators across the West, and testified in Congress at the request of both Republicans and Democrats. Mark, welcome to our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and again, sympathize with us not being able to be together, but um, this is, we'll, we will make this work. Um, I want to just, you know, note that we've worked together, um, myself and Kelly and Charlene and John, to coordinate our panel to try to tell a story. Uh, my job is to start with a little bit of background and context on the coal transition and what we really want Congress to understand to, um, to, to know where to work and how to work um, and the ways in which it might be useful for the federal government to engage. Um, Kelly is really an expert on what states are doing and what's working in different places. And she will talk about that work, which is really important for Congress to understand as well. And then Charlene and John will tell their story in a particularly vulnerable community that's facing a transition away from coal. Um, and so hopefully, it flows um, and we've done our job and we can provide good information to you. So what I wanna do is start um, with some background and get this up. Um, it's really important to note right away that major coal development in the West in particular and in the United States in the electricity sector is relatively recent. This is Jimmy Carter in 1979 standing in front of a newly completed coal-fired power plant in Kentucky, promising that the United States would use its domestic cheap and reliable coal to meet the energy needs of a growing country and that we would mine a billion tons of coal within the decade. And we did that. Um, it was a successful effort. And what's important to note about this is that the rise of coal was not accidental. It was very intentional and it was the result of um, very direct national energy policy that was responding to the growing energy needs of a country, but also to the oil crisis and price shock and worries about scarcity of natural gas and the need for domestic energy. The national policy direction really um, provided the impetus behind some pretty significant regional coordination and planning to build the infrastructure the coal-fired power plants, the transmission lines, and the mining capacity and the railroads to extract and exploit the resources that largely were located in rural places and deliver them to the growing urban markets, both on the West Coast and across the country. And so the Northwest Power Study, um, which is a graphic here, uh, and also the, the major buildup of coal infrastructure on the Colorado Plateau, including Navajo, are indications of the kind of coordination and investment and capacity that needed to be built to really facilitate uh, major coal development um, to supply the energy needs of the country. And what we did, in fact, was pretty remarkable. Um, in less than two decades, we were able to completely transition the electricity grid of the country to create the largest interconnected system in the world um, and to build the capacity to ship coal to provide um, energy to almost all of the country. Coal from the Powder River Basin supplies about 40% of all of the coal nationwide and it goes as far as Georgia. 
Um, and so this major coal development in the West was actually a pretty remarkable achievement. And it was, it depended upon national policy direction and facilitated by these strong regional plans um, with a lot of resources behind them. It is indicative that we can do major coordinated planning. And so it's important to remember um, as we're now approaching the end of life in coal, that we've done this before, that we have the capacity to do this, um, to, to basically create a major transition. It's also important to note that even this was a major transition and the rise of coal in the West was responsible for the loss of 100,000 coal mining jobs across Appalachia and the Midwest at the same time. Um, and so that leads to the kind of third part of the context that's really important to understand is that the states really set the terms of how major coal development was going to happen in the West, particularly the National Governors Association that coordinated to establish a social contract for how development would go. And really um, exemplified by Governor Art Link in North Dakota, who on the eve of kind of major coal development in his state said that we do not want to halt progress. We don't want to be selfish and say North Dakota will not share its energy resource. No, we simply want to ensure that the most efficient and environmentally sound method of utilizing, utilizing our precious resources for the benefit of the broadest number of people possible. And when we are through with that, and when the landscape is quiet again, let those who follow and repopulate, repopulate the land be able to say our grandparents did their job well. And only if we can say that, Will we be worthy of the rich heritage of our land and resources? And so the Western states um, work together to impose high severance taxes. They establish permanent funds to ensure a legacy from coal development. Um, they implemented strong bonding and reclamation requirements. And there was a really important role for labor in, in securing high wages and benefits from this work. And it lifted a lot of workers into the middle class during this period. I like Art Link's quote because it actually is important for a number of reasons. It's not anti-coal, it's also not pro-coal. It's about geography. It's about the relationship between the remote peripheral resource regions and the growing urban centers. And it's about policy. It's about the choices that we make when we choose to develop our resources. And it's a useful framework for assessing where we are now. What, what do we have going into this next transition? So I want to just note three lessons and then um, describe some policy outcomes that, that might flow from that. The first one is that that social contract has been broken in a lot of meaningful ways. Um, starting in the early 1990s, the West was a leader in energy deregulation, which shifted the responsibility for, um, for planning and regulating uh, the energy transition from states to private actors and had some pretty meaningful consequences. So for example, the coal strip power plant in Eastern Montana has four generating units. It was built by the Montana Power Company, a state regulated utility. When energy deregulation happened in Montana, that asset was sold and is now owned by seven different owners and the policy environment around transition is completely fragmented. And so the community has very little standing or, or really understanding of where to engage and how to meaningfully engage to benefit those workers in the community during the transition. So we've had a retreat from the kind of policy and regulatory consensus that built coal in the 70s. We've also had a pretty major structural change in the way the economy works and returns um, turns uh, wealth to skill. So for example, um, we've seen a big divergence between metropolitan economies and rural economies and things like your access to markets, the relative education level of your workforce and amenities that can attract talent um, and investment have really concentrated growth in major urban areas. And so we looked at all of the coal-fired power plants in the West that were closing and characterize them by the type of community. And you can see each of these bars on the left is uh, in the kind of bluish color is an isolated county. And on the right side in the darker gray is a metropolitan county. And then those rural counties that are connected to metros in the middle. And you can see across the board, average earnings per job are lower in isolated places. Average income volatility is higher in isolated places. 
And so where the transition is happening is really important. Um, and so for example, this is the EDA uh, Denver region, all of the counties in the 10 state region. 50% of all new jobs that have been created since, since 2007 have been located in just two metropolitan areas. And 46% of all the rural areas have lost more jobs than they have added. So we're seeing this big divergence. So the geography of the energy transition matters a lot. And then finally, we've had a tax revolt. So one of the big challenges for these communities is that the revenue from coal, both from federal revenue sharing from royalties, from um, severance and property taxes at the local level, can really distort the local economy. Um, communities can provide high quality services with that revenue without having to tax their own local citizens. They can become very dependent on it. And then we had a strong tax revolt across the West, which imposed severe limitations on the autonomy of local governments to manage volatile revenue and to raise taxes as some of that coal revenue goes away. So we've ossified this dependence and communities can find themselves in the position where economic development and diversification doesn't actually solve the fiscal crisis from the decline of coal. So the picture on the right is the revenue committee, joint revenue committee in Wyoming, hearing a report from, um, from REMI, which is an economic modeling uh, group, that any job created in the economy outside of the oil and gas or coal sector actually results in a budget gap. So economic growth and diversification will actually deepen the fiscal crisis in Wyoming because of that dependence on fossil fuel revenue. And it plays out at the local level as well. So we did some work um, in collaboration with the Just Transition Fund looking at the relative dependence of county governments on revenue from coal. And uh, in Bighorn County, Montana, um, which is the home of the, the Crow Reservation, you're gonna hear from, from Charlene and John later, um, the county government itself is the most dependent county on revenue from coal in the West, including Texas. Um, and that does not include revenue that goes to the tribal government. We believe the tribal government is even more dependent than the county. And so the risks associated with the transition are pretty severe. And so there's a couple of, of high level policy lessons that I wanna just um, highlight before we, we move on. There's an immediate need for national policy direction and assessment of risks and opportunities. And that's similar to what the National Economic Transition Platform is recommending, as well as some other legislation out of Congress. We also think that there's a necessity to create a new federal corporation that can finance with predictable and, and lasting revenue um, the needs of transition. And so one way to do that is to take what now is an annual revenue distribution from royalties from coal and other fossil fuels and instead invest it in a permanent fund. That permanent fund becomes the dedicated financing source by which we can do direct assistance to states and local governments to help them with their transition priorities. And finally, there's a need to address equity outcomes and forward-looking planning at the local level so that the priori priorities are locally identified but they are supported with capacity and funding from the federal and state level down. Um, and a lot of that local equity work really needs to happen in, a, a, in some building blocks. First, there's a need to just provide some basic infrastructure and services that have been uh, underinvested in over the last couple of decades, particularly in these remote communities. There's a need to develop a workforce to actually build and maintain, sustain those services and infrastructure over time. And only after you've done those two things is there an opportunity to really think about diversifying and training a workforce to, to identify new opportunities and really capture local competitive advantages. And so those building blocks are a really important part of this kind of national assessment funded by a new arrangement, fiscal arrangement between federal resources and local governments and then prioritizing those, those local um, plans and needs. Um, so I will end there, um, and I will look forward to my colleagues' presentations and, and questions at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. It was a great presentation, very interesting. Um, we are gonna move to our second panelist, uh, Kelly Romer. She is a PhD student 
of Geography in the Department of Earth Sciences at Montana State University. Uh, her research investigates community resilience and planning dynamics in rural communities um, as, it, as they relate to coal communities. So Kelly, welcome. Thank you for taking time away from your studies <laughs> and your research to join us today. I uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. I'll just share my screen really quick. All right. Can you guys see that? Yes. Perfect. Um, well, good morning and good afternoon to those on the East Coast. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to Amber and Daniel and the rest of the team for the invitation to speak today. Um, at today's workforce briefing on the energy transition in coal country. I'm excited for the opportunity to share some recent research looking at how our existing policy landscape uh, adequately addresses the needs of transitioning coal communities in the West. Let's see. I am a PhD student studying rural community development and resource geography in Dr. Julie Haggerty's Resources and Communities Research Group. Our work focuses on the intersection of natural resource development and rural community resilience. I'm primarily interested in how these remote isolated communities can respond to change and shock. By conducting community-based research that informs practice and policy and development, our work aims to fulfill MSU's land-grant mission. Um, I ho I'm hoping to build on Mark's context and about the, the history of the West regional approach to coal development, as well as the implications of the changing economy and the change, the implications for um, different economic geographies. There'll only be a little bit of overlap, I promise. Um, and I will focus on three points. First, I'm gonna share a little bit more about the factors shaping the local planning response to closure in these remote isolated coal communities. Then, because federal and state policy shape the direction and pace of these transitions and have long-term implications for resilience in these communities, I'll share how uh, U.S. energy policy and state transition policy are influencing what options are available to these coal communities as they navigate the social and economic impacts of this energy transition. Finally, I'll, I'll end with some findings from interviews with policy experts and economic development practitioners, exa examining how the existing transition assistance is aligned or not with the needs of the rural communities that they serve. So Mark touched on this, but these coal plant and mine closures will have acute impacts on these remote isolated communities. Compared to the metropolitan or their connected counterparts, they are significantly more vulnerable to this loss. There is a need to plan for the loss of employment and tax revenue, as well as the economic base activity, and a need to ensure that there's adequate decommissioning and environmental remediation. Mark also touched on the, the complex ownership regime. So transitioning coal communities um, confront a complex ownership regime that challenges their ability to plan for transition. Mark noted also the coal strip generation station where the four units are owned by six individual entities and just to elaborate that these owners span across three states, are governed by different regulatory processes and portfolio standards. These standards influence how each owner will decide to act about the end of life processes of these plants. And so for communities, this adds an extra layer of uncertainty about closure dates and also Negotiating timelines and securing transition funds places incredible demands on local capacity and resources that could be used 
um, for other comprehensive planning activities. So despite this great need to plan, uh, existing transition planning at the local level is limited. The strength of strategies employed is dependent on the resources and capacity that already exist in each community. And it's important to note that the strong economic and cultural ties to the coal industry can influence and limit the types of strategies that communi communities engage in. The less remote isolated communities will need assistance that provo provides support in mitigating the economic and physical impacts that Mark outlined, as well as support in negotiating these closure dates and securing transition funds. They will also need early and long-term assistance for both community planning and um, assistance for dislocated workers. And so, the question I, I asked is, how does existing federal energy and the state policy address these needs? Beginning with, with federal energy policy, Mark outlined some early energy policy that coordinated the development of coal resources in the West. And from just looking at how energy policy has been made over the last 30 years, uh, from 1975 to 2005, U.S. energy policy was generally legislated in these large complex bills occurring every five to 10 years that were often driven by the global, by a global energy or a financial crisis. The Energy Policy Act of 2005 is our most recent comprehensive general legislation. However, in the last 10 years, the process of making energy policy has become increasingly politicized marked with an uptick in executive actions and executive orders. The absence of coordinated policy that facilitates the energy transition has important implications for these frontline communities. The unstable and rapidly changing policy sends conflicting messages and exacerbates uncertainty about the transition. It also puts all of the responsibility of planning or deciding to plan on communities who as one economic development practitioner put it, are hesitant to, to plan at all for fear of, quote, turning their back on a powerful industry that has supported them for so long, end quote. Without a comprehensive national policy framework addressing the implications of the coal transition, several Western states have enacted their own legislation to address the impacts of the decline of the coal industry. A review of legislation in Colorado, Montana, New Mexico, Washington, and Wyoming illustrates a range of strategies and support for transition. While no two states are the same, there are two distinct and diverging types of approaches. One policy approach um, identified by the states in green attempts to accelerate the energy transition away from coal-based electricity and seeks to clarify the pace of transition, often by setting closure dates or incentives to expedite coal plant retirements. The other policy approach in the states in yellow works to slow the energy system transition by bolstering the coal industry, perhaps providing loans to coal plants and um, postpone plant retirement as long as possible. For communities negotiating this transition landscape, this, your state approach has important implications for what you're experiencing at the local level. First, the policies that are accelerating the pace of transition provide two important things, certainty and a timeline that can inform local strategies. For example, an, an expert familiar with the negotiations of the 2011 Washington Coal Transition Bill emphasized the importance of the extended timeline for preparing workforce and labor impacts, for preparing for workforce and labor impacts. According to the interviewee, an earlier version of the bill setting the closure date at 2015 was opposed by labor stakeholders. 
and more support was garnered by the 2020 and 2025 closure dates that provided, quote, more time to plan and think about the redirection of their workforce, end quote. These longer timelines allow communities to engage thoughtfully in strategic approaches that will address the differentiated impacts of labor changes. Second, despite state efforts to postpone cold, <laughs> postpone cold decline as long as possible, as seen in the recent policies in Montana and Wyoming, communities are more exposed to unexpected closures and layoffs. Without access to a planned approach, mitigating the impacts of revenue loss um, and employment loss, local municipalities are driving towards a fiscal crisis. Finally, there are a set of transition assistance programs that have emerged in, um, that emerged in 2015 during the Obama administ administration. They have shifted from the power program to assistance in the coal communities. And generally these programs target resources to bolster the EDA's existing economic development programs through grant funding and technical assistance. Also some funding goes through the Department of Labor's worker dislocation programs. Importantly, to qualify for these funds, you need to demonstrate economic distress due to changes in the coal industry. So through interviews with experts and economic development practitioners, there are, are some clear gaps between these programs and the needs of rural coal reliant communities. First, <clears throat> several experts and practitioners ident identified a central challenge to supporting community transitions is the lack of obvious development options able to replace the coal-based tax revenue, economic base activity, and employment. An economic development practitioner who works for a regional development district describes how this reality affects community stakeholders' willingness to discuss even the topic of transition. They would sit in a room and start talking about transitioning economies that there's not a direct replacement for that. I think that the backfill of revenue support to communities is a piece that we have not figured out well on any level. If we could figure that out, communities would be much more willing to transition. The absence of these structures to address revenue loss was a concern mentioned by nearly every one I interviewed. In addition, interviewees expressed fear of the loss of the services and institutions that may come with the closure of a coal mine or plant. Previous studies examining economic transitions in resource dependent places emphasize the importance of economic diversification in planning before the decline occurs. In addition to proactive planning, transition strategies need to mitigate the immediate impacts and provide long-term support. Interviews demonstrate that the timelines of federal transition assistance are incongruent with the needs of the impacted communities. Federal and state resources for communities are often not available until formal announcements of closure or demonstrated layoffs. Instead, these resources operate as emergency assistance and practitioners are concerned that by the time communities are able to access these resources, it may be too late. Economic and community practitioners also emphasize that projects linked to long-term solutions will take time. And it's important to understand that, quote, you're not going to come in with a three-year grant and save the community, end quote. As many of these grants operate on short-term funding cycles, practitioners are asking for support that can be linked to long-term economic development goals. ATAX um, policy experts are also calling for larger investments and greater external support for impacted communities and workers than existing programs like the ACC provide. One expert with the national public policy firm assessed that federal intervention is key and that impacted communities and regions may need long-term reinvestment, quote, orders of magnitude higher than existing grants or loans, end quote. So findings from this policy analysis and an understanding of uh, the needs of these transitioning rural communities 
highlight several opportunities to improve policy to address the coal transition. At the federal level, we need comprehensive legislation that coordinates the energy transition. By establishing clear emissions targets, we can know closure timelines and strategies to assess and address the inequities in our current energy system. In coordination with new energy policy, transition assistance programs need to be significantly expanded in terms of scope and scale. This could be done by establishing an independent entity that ensures the coordination and funding in the areas of job losses, critical location infrastructure, and equitable access to economic opportunities. Policy experts are also calling for long-term predictable funding for assistance programs and significant reinvestment in our most vulnerable impacted communities, workers, and regions. Finally, more, flexi more flexibility is needed in how grant programs can be assessed to better meet the needs of vulnerable workers and communities. Um, thank you so much for listening. I'm excited for the discussion that will follow. This work has been supported by National Science Foundation and USDA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, thanks for your presentation. That was really interesting. Um, and uh, um, it's a great sort of um, sort of place to leave that portion of the conversation because now we're going to hear from two panelists, uh, and they're going to I'm going to introduce them at the same time because they are going to um, their their presentation is going to be made together. So we're really excited about that. Uh, our first the first of the two uh, is Charlene Yarlot Johnson. She is a member of the Absoluka Tribe and the founder and executive director for Plenty Doors Community Development Corporation. She has lived on or near the Crow Reservation for most of her life. She obtained her bachelor's degree at Montana State University in Bozeman and a master's in public health from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Prior to Plenty Doors CDC, Charlene worked with the Indian Health Service for almost 25 years as a public health nutritionist and as an administrator. Her interest in starting a nonprofit organization focused on community economic development started while working with the Indian Health Service, her work with Plenty Doors CDC has opened her eyes to the tremendous need on the reservation. And her co-presenter is John Doyle. John is an Absoluka elder. He has a strong ongoing interest in community and safe water for the homeland. He is a founding board member of Plenty Doors CDC and has led the work to improve water systems on the Crow Reservation. His life work, knowledge, and wisdom has guided the direction uh, for Plenty Doors CDC, as well as other uh, organizations. Charlene, John, welcome to the briefing today. I uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. You. So I'm just going to take a little bit of time to share um, my screen. And, um, and so we're just going to present this way rather than with this full screen. Um, it just is easier for us to um, anticipate what's, gonna, what's coming up. All right. So just so uh, you know. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. And um, so the Crow Reservation is located in southeastern Montana, and it is home to the Abzalaga Nation. The Crow Nation is, um, has over 14,000 members with approximately 7,000 that live on the reservation. The Crow tribe has been dependent on coal for 45 years. And um, According to Mark Haggerty, Bighorn County, where um, the majority of the reservation um, lies, um, um, was considered the most coal impacted um, county in the western part of the United States. At the peak of co the coal economy, up to 75% of the revenue um, that funds the Crow tribal government was from coal. And so when the demand for coal um, decline because of um, other cheaper sources like natural gas. Um, that forced the tribe to lay off um, a thousand, over a thousand of its 1,300 employees. And so these aren't individuals who actually work in the coal mine. These are individuals whose jobs were funded by the coal revenue. John, did you have? I, I think I would add to uh, that comment is that 
um, because the mines couldn't employ um, a thousand individuals, those coal dollars were channeled through the tribe through a court action in order for us to collect those dollars, the tax dollars from the mine. And uh, what, the, what the map is currently showing on the screen is our original homeland. The dark line, the dark line is where our, um, our people were um, in about 1780 until the first pandemic of smallpox reduced our numbers greatly. And the green line is um, where we were at during the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty Days. And then you can see the, the sessions of land that have came after that. And, you know, the big mines that we're talking about were within our territory. And so all of that revenue that's been generated at the state and federal government and the county government has enjoyed has came from our Crow homeland. And yet, here we are in uh, one of the worst poverty conditions that you could possibly imagine. Okay. Let me tell you about Plenty Doors. So Plenty Doors Community Development Corporation was um, uh, established in May of 2018. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. And the intent of Plenty Doors is to create thriving com communities through a diverse economy and building individual and community capacity. So um, when we started, Plenty Doors um, worked on in, um, assisting entrepreneurs to start businesses. We um, provided education and resources to community members to build up their capacity. Um, we hosted two economic forums, and that's when we first met um, Mark and Kelly. Um, they assisted us with that, where we identified um, priority, um, prioritize um, our economic, um, um, anyway, uh, prioritize where we wanted to focus. And uh, we found that workforce development was um, the foundation for all of that. We identified tourism, um, agriculture, um, businesses, and also um, renewable energy. We have partnered with Little Bighorn College, the local tribal college, the Absalaga Nation Housing Authority, and the Department of Labor and Industry. And so we were very busy working on that and then COVID hit. And so when COVID hit, we had to shift our focus. And so re remember, as I think it was Kelly who said, the capacity of our community. Um, so we um, jumped right in and we changed our focus to helping with the local response. Um, so we, um, Plenty Doors currently serves on the incident command team and we represent other nonprofits on this team. Um, we started a local network of nonprofits to ensure that we're responding in an effective way. Because there were already two food pantries that are located on or near the reservation, we primarily focused on providing cleaning supplies and PPE. Um, but we also identified gaps um, um, where we could help, like we purchased shelf stable um, food. We purchased water when um, we didn't have water in Crow Agency or in Wyola, and that's an ongoing problem that John can probably talk about, that we'll talk about later. Um, we also provided fuel for the food pantries and hunters so that hunters could buy gas they, when they went hunting. We also set up an account at the local butcher so um, hunters could come back bring their um, game and they could be processed and the meat could be donated. Um, we became a um, clearinghouse for purchased and donated PPE, dog food and diapers. Um, we we um, continue to provide um, the cleaning supplies. We provide them to families, to other nonprofits, to communities, and we also provide them to the um, tribal ICP. Um, Another thing that we have done, we did during, because of COVID is that we also contributed to phase two of the Wyola lift station repair. So um, the Wyola lift station was not working. So we had raw sewage that was um, pouring out into, the, into a ditch and this had been happening for a couple years. And because of COVID, um, the importance of that was elevated. Um, and so that we were um, able to have um, Partners, we, we were um, one of four entities that contributed money for the temporary repair of that um, lift station. And so they're still planning on the um, permanent repair. Um, 
We also participated in the newly formed um, Water Sanitation and Hygiene Task Force. And this was um, formed in response to COVID. There are groups of people in our community who've researched this information, who've indicated that this is an ongoing problem, but because of COVID, it's um, again, again elevated. And so um, many households are living in, um, with failing wastewater systems and contaminated wells. Um, so we have a task force. Again, it takes many of us. Um, so we have a task force of so the Environmental um, Health Steering Committee, the Tribal Health, the Crow Water Resource Department, the Absalaga Water and Wastewater Authority, Absalaga Nation Housing Authority, the Little Bighorn College, the Indian Health Service, and Plenty Doors. So we have a combination of federal and local organizations working on that. So our goal is to address immediate water and wastewater issues for rural homes and communities and to create a trained workforce and system that can be sustained and ensure safe water for all of our households and communities. Um, Currently, Plenty Doors is also working on working with a network of organizations um, where we're focused on creating food sovereignty and uh, improving the capacity of our local food pantries to store and um, to store and to distribute food. And so that's kind of been one of the efforts that we've been working on. We're also working on trying to obtain relief funding for local businesses. So that's kind of how Plenty Doors started and we've kind of had to shift and it's kind of going back to where we're um, working. We're also working on becoming um, a CDFI, a community development financial institution. Um, and we also, one of our um, strategic goals is to create a venue or a building, a multi-use building that would house um, and incubate businesses. And we're looking at a grocery store. And one thing that I failed to mention earlier is that not only did we lose um, a thousand jobs in the community where we have 7,000 people in our, in our, on our reservation, but we also um, had our, um, one of our one of our two only grocery stores on a reservation burned down, and so we lost another 18 jobs. So not only jobs lost, but food access lost too. So anyway, um, so that's um, kind of that's plenty doors. Um, so John, for the our economic based assets, we've been selling our assets. That's how the tribal government has functioned. Uh, we did and do receive uh, tax revenue from the coal mine, but only from the coal mine after a court case that decided that we were able to do that. But for the most part, uh, the tribe survived by selling land and selling uh, or leasing land and selling land. And that process has continued. And each one of those sessions of land shows that progression. And where we're at now is a small red uh, map that shows our current uh, location. We have no, uh, like Charlene said, we only have one grocery store. That's not in our largest town. Our largest town is Crow Agency, where I'm at right now. We have to either travel to Lodgegrass, which is a smaller s grocery store, but it does have grocery stores. And the rest is travel from here to Hardin, our Billings, our Sheridan, and Wyoming. And so, at a time of isolation and pandemic uh, worries, uh, we were not isolated because in order for us to buy groceries or whatever the need was, we traveled for that. And so our population was always out and about. Uh, we have a, a population that is, there's, there might be two or three families per home. And so them daily trips for groceries are, it's daily. You know, if you have uh, 15 to 20 people living in a home, which we do have, then uh, you can see um, how stressed we become in that environment that we're in. And if there are jobs, uh, if you're not working at the mine, there's probably, I think there's about 80 jobs there right now. And I heard they were going to have an additional layoff. I, I don't know when that's going to happen, but that's coming. So Billings is our job market. And uh, so that's a daily trip for those that do work there, 60 miles one way. And so we have no economy to speak of really. There's an egg economy that really is, um, you know, geared toward livestock. There is wheat and there is uh, sugar beets to a certain amount, but basically livestock cows are the, the main economy here. And leasing of that land for that livestock or production of hay 
is the other part of it. But for the bigger population, there is no uh, alternatives. There's no jobs and uh, there's uh, no place to get them. And if you don't have transportation, and I've been there too, because I, I didn't have my, my pickup was broke down. You're here and uh, you don't go for groceries anywhere. You just stay here and do with what you've got. And so, um, I mean, I could go on and on about that stuff, but j to keep it short, I'll switch it, switch it over to you, Charlene. Okay, all right. So um, the issue um, with our communities, as John said, is our failing infrastructure or um, that he alluded, alluded to. So we have multiple families that are living in single homes and that we have homes that are not meant to house that many people and they're in disrepair. Um, we're experiencing a phenomenon um, that we as Crow people have never experienced before. We used to pride ourselves that people always had a place to go because of their extended families. Um, but now uh, we actually have homeless people who are walking around Crow Agency, uh, that's our capital. Um, there are a few jobs available, very few businesses that provide the services that are needed. And then uh, the Crow Reservation lacks locally run uh, community base businesses and the economic um, infrastructure to support them. Um, so Don kind of mentioned COVID and so uh, uh, Bighorn County and the Crow Nation are currently experiencing more co positive COVID cases and more deaths per capita than any other county in Montana. Uh, we're actually uh, are in early August, our rates exceeded that per cap, or per 100,000, our rates actually exceeded that of Navajo. Um, and so uh, just to give you an idea, Big Horn County population makes up 1.3% of the state's population, but we make up about 15% of the deaths from COVID. Uh, so it's huge, it's had a huge impact and a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have um, a failing infrastructure. We have too many people in one home, um, all of the above. Um, so anyway, it's uh, one of the things that we have on here is investing in people through education is one way that we can help ourselves. So we are going to mention that again. Um, one of the things that has uh, is that happens is that um, our colleges are not um, funded at the same level as other colleges and universities. So here is the our um, what Crow Agency looks like. So John can talk about this a little bit. He um, so the photo on the left is a, a, not only a picture of Crow Agency, but the large building on the lower right side uh, it was a carpet factory at one time in the 60s, in the early 70s, and that was an effort that tribe made to try to uh, bring economic development into our community. And so um, what you see in the immediate foreground is that large grassy area there with trees. That was the old wastewater lagoon. And that wastewater lagoon was failing because it was built 50 years ago or more. And it was built for a different size community. And as it failed, that wastewater was flowing into the Little Bighorn River in large volumes. And then on the right side is the wastewater lagoon uh, as it was replaced and rebuilt. But what the reason we're showing that photograph is uh, that new lagoon came about because we had a functioning government there was a functioning government that was able to address uh, um, needs in our community, failing infrastructure. So on the left was what we replaced, and this is what we have on the right now. And uh, as part of that, Bighorn County, when it was receiving its royalties, did pay and give to the tribe $100,000 to help in the construction of that. That, was, that lagoon is a $5 million facility and it took uh, at least a dozen different uh, funding agencies to put together the funding package. But what it showed for us is that we were able to function and operate as a government as long as we had the revenue coming in. And when it didn't come in, um, then the stuff that Charlene's talking about in Wyola and um, you know all of our rural residents, and we have 850 homes that are dependent on either septic systems or wells and 40% of those that we're finding have contamination issues, cross-contamination from staling septic systems and wells that are drilled much too shallow. And so that's just kind of a little glimpse of it. Um, we also partnered with um, Bighorn County and 
uh, shared the cost of solid waste. And um, when the tribe won its court case, uh, one of the first things that the tribe did was cost share solid waste for the county. And so while the majority of those canister sites were within uh, the reservation boundaries, there were a couple outside, but we did cost share that. It was a, nearly a $700,000 uh, budget to do that, to do all that hauling and bring it to a central location. Now that the funding is no longer available in there, the county, because the tribe was not contributing, the county cut the garbage service off and each of our communities now have um, massive amounts of solid waste piling and burning daily almost. And um, so that housing that you're seeing in there sometimes has a blanket of uh, waste garbage smoke going over that community, that part of town. And so at any point in town with the wind shifting, the, the air is intolerable. But so the, the fire, forest fire smokes are one thing, but we also add to that this burning smell of garbage. So that's kind of a little glimpse of our infrastructure failing. There's much more, of course. and. Um, when I say community, uh, we're speaking about our current reservation. It's probably 100 miles wide and 80 miles um, deep. And so uh, Prior, which is 75 miles east of us, or west of us, that's our community too, you know. So we don't leave any of the communities out. We don't say that Crow Agency is a central focus in the effort. It's all of the communities. Absolutely. This the slide is just to kind of show you what we did with COVID. Um, we actually, at the beginning, were making masks. The college partnered with us and their staff made, um, made masks. And then we have um, an individual here who was making hand sanitizer because that was when we had a shortage. But we delivered uh, cleaning supplies and other supplies to every single community, every single district. Um, we also, this is where, where um, when Crow Agency actually did not have water, uh, we provided water to the community. And um, so anyway, that's um, just some pictures there. You know, the other thing that I just wanted to note also is that, um, you know, the, some of the grants that are out there to assist um, with our uh, coal impacted communities, the power grant, Kelly had mentioned the need to uh, ex extend the scope um, and the flexibility of that. So that, that grant was available to the state of Montana and it does help coal miners and coal plant workers. But, you know, we had the thousand employees that were impacted by the decline in coal were actually not coal miners. They were actually tribal workers. So there was no way that we could provide assistance for them. So um, what do we have as assets? We have um, the Little Bighorn College. It's our tribal um, college. Um, they offer um, 11 two-year associate degree programs and they have eight one-year certificate programs. They've graduated since um, the beginning, since it's been established, they've graduated um, over a thousand students and they, the, um, the CDL program, which is the only trades program that they have, has graduated almost 40. Um, students. This is Little Bighorn College. Uh, it's for the, uh, the students here at LBHC, but it is also for the community. It's used by the community members for reading uh, materials, but also computer access for those that don't have computers, but also a part of this building, which makes it one of our more valuable buildings is our tribal archives are, is in there and our history is in there. And for our young people in a changing time, that resource is so valuable to us and to our, to our current generation, but for generations ahead, we can see the need to grow the archives more. So as I mentioned before, our workforce training program at the college, um, it's currently uh, consists of the CDL. Um, and with the work that we've done with Plenty Doors, we've brought key partners together and we've identified areas that we need to work on to build the capacity uh, of our community and our individuals. And so again, there's a housing issue, there's um, water <laughs> issues. And so the college has been wonderful. They've um, partnered with the housing authority. We've kind of been in there wherever we can help. Um, but to uh, create programs like plumbing, 
um, for electrical, for carpentry, uh, for HVAC. And so they're at the very beginning stages of that. And so they're partnering with MSU Northern, with the Department of Labor and Industry, just to create those apprenticeship programs. And we have a partner with the Department of Labor and Industry, and they're looking at ways that we can do the apprenticeship with the Housing Authority, and if we can um, provide some leeway to help us be successful. Um, so anyway, that's um, something that we're also working on. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that, John? No. No, okay. All right, so um, lastly is what needs to happen. Um, the one thing that we really wanna advocate is to, that um, to, for us to help ourselves, you need to allow us to help us invest in our future. So education systems like tribal colleges. And as I mentioned earlier, that um, equity in, um, in resources uh, would be very, very helpful. Uh, currently, tribal colleges receive just a fraction of what universities and other colleges receive. And so co colleges um, create community jobs, and that allows our Abzalaga people to invest in that education. Um, it's important um, that we have sustainable revenue for our tribal colleges and also to recognize that the role of nonprofits is important in um, identifying solutions and lightening the load, so to speak. And so that's something when we, uh, when COVID hit, we had all those nonprofits come together. And so they provided the food relief or we provided the cleaning supplies. And we actually assisted the tribe a lot and filled in a lot of gaps when they weren't able to. And so it's important that there's other entities within the community that can strengthen that community and to make those investments in those um, organizations is important. John, did you have anything else to add? No, to that? I think that, that sums it up pretty good there. Okay, and with that, that concludes our um, presentation. If you have any uh, questions at all, again, thank you for the opportunity for us to talk on behalf of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene, and thank you, John, for joining us today to tell the story of your community um, and uh, help us understand a little bit about what life is like out there. And um, you mentioned that there was um, uh, wildfire smoke. Um, I can only imagine what it must be like out there. I know here in DC, we have a little bit of the haze. So I'm really sorry um, that you're also having to, to go through that as well as uh, along with everyone who might be watching this on the West Coast, who's even closer to the fires. Um, we're definitely thinking about everybody out there. So, but once again, thank you. Uh, we do have time for questions. And um, this is the point where I remind people that if you have questions, you can follow us on Twitter at ESI online. Or you can also send us an email, ESI at ESI.org. And even though I forgot to remind people of that, we've actually been getting questions in. So thank you for that. This is also the time when I get to introduce my colleague, Amber Tudoroff. She is going to kick off our Q&A session. So Amber, I'll turn it over to you and um, look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Dan. And thank you to our amazing speakers. I learned so much and um, I'm just so grateful that this work is being done. Um, so first question, what do you want people to know about cold communities that they wouldn't know otherwise or common misconceptions that you would want to correct? Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mark. One of the things that I've learned in working with these communities is there's a perception that uh, rural communities that are specialized on a single industry are somehow ideologically positioned or they are backwards looking, and that is not the case. Um, there are really important barriers to understand that these communities face and they, they have a set of choices that are delivered to them that kind of, you know, the incentives and the options that they face are pretty limited. And actually by giving them more opportunity and giving them more tools to work with, there's incredible opportunity out there in a lot of these places. Um, I know uh, I've been out to Bighorn County and Charlene and John, um, do it some justice, but they've got two national parks, they've got a national wildlife refuge. If anyone's ever been to the Bighorn Battlefield, it is one of the most incredible interpretive sites that I've ever been to. Um, the, it's got the Bighorn River, which is a premier trout fishing river for folks like me that are into that. 
Um, and they're close to Billings. I mean, there are significant opportunities and if we can find a way to overcome some of the revenue dependence and structural barriers that are there, um, you know, there's, there's great opportunity out there. So I would say, you know, don't think of these communities pejoratively, um, get to know the people and, and really, you know, help them thrive. I would add to that, that um, uh, we've not been just sitting idly waiting for something to happen. The tribe has looked toward uh, developing alternative energy, wind and water. Uh, we do have a big major dam that has potential for the tribe to develop hydropower. Um, but one of our problems, and it's the big problem that um, I think most tribes across the West face, and that is power transmission lines. You can produce all that power that you want, but if you can't get it to the market, then that does very little to try to, you can't even afford to build it, I guess. Thanks for that. And this next question is, um, I guess, targeted towards more Charlene and John. But um, you guys talked a lot about this college. Um, how, how is the, fun, um, the college currently being funded, especially in terms of federal funding? Good question. Um, so um, I believe that they see they, they receive the same type of um, funding that um, that the universities do. Uh, they also receive funding in the form of grants and also um, uh, of course tuition Pell Grant. Um, but again, their reimbursement rate for I can't remember what it's called something per student. It is quite a bit less than that for um, colleges for um, other universities. Hopefully that answers that question. John, did you have anything to add to that? I, they do get funding from the BIA too, but that's based on eligible students. And so when uh, the student population is down, then that revenue for the college is down also. Thanks, uh, Charlene and John for that. Um, I'm gonna ask a question from our audience. And um, Mark, you're specifically mentioned, uh, Charlene, you are too in the question, but that doesn't mean it's limited to you. So um, I hope everyone will feel, um, uh, have something to say. If, if Speak up if you have something to say is what I'm trying to say. Um, it says, Mark mentioned that to get equity outcomes and forward looking planning at the local level, first we need investments in infrastructure and services. Are the efforts and programs that Charlene talked about related to wastewater and water infrastructure, workforce development, and maintenance, the kinds of programs that are the first steps. And the second part of the question is, what are infrastructure and what are the infrastructure elements and services that ought to be addressed first to help communities uh, like the ones you've talked about today? So maybe Mark, we'll start with you and then Charlene, maybe we'll go to you and then I'm very eager to hear what John and Kelly have to say as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is consistent across a lot of rural places and I think is very acute um, in Bighorn County and on the Crow Reservation is that there's been a kind of systemic underinvestment in just basic services, right? In infrastructure, there's crumbling infrastructure out there. And the inability of a lot of rural places to just deliver basic services is not only a equity and human issue that needs to be addressed, but it is a major barrier to any further workforce development and economic opportunity. And so um, it's not rocket science. You're talking about, um, you know, clean water, um, sewer systems, waste management, um, roads, just pretty basic local government stuff. Charlene, from your perspective, what are the types of infrastructure investments that you would prioritize uh, in communities like the ones we've talked about today? Well, I would say the same thing, water and wastewater. Uh, I'm learning so much uh, while I'm doing this work. Uh, so we've had an opportunity to work with an um, epidemiolo epidemiologist who's worked in um, third world countries. And he, we are fortunate that he's come to work with the Crow tribe with the COVID outbreak. And, um, and he has um, indicated that uh, this is, um, our conditions here are um, similar to those in other countries that he's worked in, and it's the most basic need in order to address health and, and uh, the water and, and uh, 
the wastewater is just the, mo the most basic need. If we could do that, we could, um, and again, I'm looking at it from, um, from a health standpoint. And so if we can improve the health of our community, and that's the first thing, and he said, having safe water can extend our lives by 10 years. And so if you know the statistics, Native Americans life expectancy is about 20 years less than that of the average American. Hmm. So if we could just do that, and um, John knows way more about the water situations in each of the communities. So Croatency, the fact that we haven't had water, that we have um, a sewage that's coming out at the corner of the college. <laughs> Um, and then, or even water um, uh, leaking out of the um, tank up on the top of the hill, and we have people who have don't don't have water. We have the town of Wyola with the sewage coming out, and then they have no water. They they had to dig a new well, um, and then there's issues with prior as well. John, did you have anything to add to that? Oh, there's a lot to add to that, but you know, one of the things that we um, we found when we were we were looking for the funding for the town of Crow, a big portion of the wastewater has been done in the drinking line, drinking water service lines. But uh, as we were looking for funding, we found that some of the federal funding agencies were reluctant to uh, help fund uh, like the wastewater lagoon because we had mentioned that uh, we anticipated tying into the system, the uh, Little Bighorn Battlefield and a future rest stop, which would be economic development, but is also pay for the operation of the, the infrastructure. And uh, that was not uh, something that they wanted to include into that funding package. We had to m remove that language out of there. But really that was our thinking is that not only are we addressing our current needs, but it's trying to address that economic issue that we knew was coming. You know, we know uh, that this was coming down the road for a, a long time. And how do you get ready for that? What, what's your priority? Like you said, for us, it was water and wastewater. And uh, when we talk about water and wastewater, it's not only in our towns. Like I said, there's 850 homes in the rural areas that are in need, uh, real, real bad need. So. I think another important thing. Go ahead, Mark, please. Another important thing for um, federal staff to understand, um, and I know Charlene mentioned this, the tribal government has a special relationship with the federal government, right? They're actually an autonomous nation. But there are many, many entities working together at the tribal, local, and state level. Um, and this is true across these communities. There's nonprofit partners. The tribal college is a really important entity that has a lot of capacity to, to work with federal agencies. And so um, we need the coordination and the flexibility that Kelly really highlighted, um, but we also need to, to be able to recognize where the entities are that have the capacity and the standing in communities to actually do the work. Um, and that requires a whole different level of commitment and assessment and coordination at the federal level that we just don't have right now. One thing I'd like to add um, with the federal level, uh, and I would say more for a programmatic level, is to um, look at whether um, programs are truly um, helping the people that they're meant to help. And, and we found, we've come across, we've, we've tried to um, find solutions for our households. And so I think it's really important that as we try to improve, whether it's homes or um, building wells or whatever, that we take a look at the processes and the requirements. Are they helpful or are they not? Um, and we found that in many times they're not. Kelly, I'm very happy to give you the last word. I, you are welcome to weigh in on infrastructure investments. Uh, you're welcome to weigh in following up on what Charlene just discussed, policy gaps. Um, it's a little bit of a free for all for you. So um, I'll invite you to, to, to help us wrap up today. Well, thank you so much. Well, two things really come to mind. Just speaking from the, the literature about community resilience, what makes communities able to respond to shock or, or change is to be able to re rely on those um, institutions that hold the community together. And that is really um, grounded in, you know, 
having a healthy infrastructure and services that increase the quality of life for everyone. And so that is important to make sure everyone gets to like a, a level where you can lean on those when you need them to be able to respond to shock or change when that happens. And then secondly, just in terms of um, one thing that I found in my, in my interviews is the thinness of federal, um, federal resources themselves, just in, in terms of human capacity for economic development specialists who are responsible for carrying out these programs. They, in the West, are spread pretty thin with one uh, specialist covering the state of uh, Montana and Wyoming and one in Utah and Colorado. And so um, these, these folks are trying their best to carry out these programs, but they have a lot to do and a huge geography to cover. And so thinking about ways to increase capacity at all levels uh, to support coordination of these programs seems like a high priority. So thank you. Great, thanks. Um, that's a, a great point to make. And um, I think it also um, sort of puts an added emphasis on the reason why briefings like this are so important to get these kinds of um, perspectives to a policymaking audience, people who may not have the opportunity, especially these days, to travel out west to meet with people. If there's a one bummer about having to do these briefings online, it's not being able to meet you in person. Um, it would be a lot more fun if you were here with us in Washington and we had a chance to get to know each other a little bit. But this was an excellent panel. Mark, Kelly, Charlene, and John, thank you um, very, very much for joining us today and helping our audience understand um, what your communities are facing and um, also what they're doing um, in response. It was uh, really informative. I learned a lot um, and um, it means a lot to us to have uh, for you to take time out of your busy days and join us. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it there. Um, uh, we will post, there it is right there. There's a link there to a survey. If you have a few moments, um, I hope you'll take an opportunity to uh, help us by filling out that survey. Um, we pay very close attention to the feedback we receive and we try to always do better, um, whether it's in terms of the topics that we cover um, or, um, you know, the kinds of other materials that we might be willing to or might be able to provide. And speaking of materials, the materials that we use today um, will be available online. Um, there's the link to this briefing's webpage. And just as a reminder, if you missed last week's or the weeks before, uh, Workforce Wednesday briefings, everything is available online, including written summaries. So if uh, you just need to go back and find something, you don't necessarily have to watch the whole briefing, although we'd like you to. Um, we do also post written summaries. And uh, a reminder, next Friday, um, I hope you will sign up for our bonus briefing presented in partnership with the Just Transition Fund. This briefing is titled, Achieving an Equitable Future, the National Economic Transition Platform for Coal Communities. A special session is next Friday, September 25th. And once again, visit us online, www.esi.org to learn more and to register. Next Wednesday, we will be back for regularly scheduled Workforce Wednesdays, uh, Growing Green Industry and Innovation, Mass Timber. And following the last one of the series will be Low Carbon Small Business and Post-COVID Recovery. We'll go ahead and end it there. Thanks very much to Team ESI, especially Amber, the policy team, Omri and Dano uh, and our interns who are helping us with questions and note taking and uh, helping us uh, behind the scenes, keeping, keeping everything running on time. So uh, once again, Mark, Kelly, Charlene, and John, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we wish you the best and hope everyone has a great west, rest of your Wednesday afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.